Sooner fans, and welcome to another edition of the Ryan Odom UMBC Basketball Show and uh, our podcast here this afternoon. And uh, filling in for Ryan Odom today, we're joined by uh, assistant coach Nate Dixon. Nate, welcome in. I appreciate you having me. Are you excited about filling in for Coach Odom today? Uh, yes. <laughs> big shoes to fill. <laughs> uh, coach, let's talk about first, we'll talk about Richmond. A uh, tough loss for you guys, 78-75 on the road. Um, you guys fell behind early, uh, built a 14-point lead. It was a seesaw battle. Uh, but you just came up a little bit short. I guess early on, they jumped out to an early lead, 19-9, to and uh, just a little bit of a slow start. How concerning is the slow start for you guys? You know, it's, it's funny. Coach and, and our staff, we've talked about it over the last couple of days, and we've had a tendency to not start quick. It's almost like our guys are filling the other team out. You know, you see them on film. They ha they're not familiar with them. Maybe they've played against them in high school, but they're not as familiar with them other than film. And so... You know, to tell them what they're going to do on film versus actually yeah. having it happen, the speed of the cuts, the way they read, the way they play, um, you know, Klein with the hook passes and, and understanding. Uh, I, we think sometimes that you kind of feel the game a little bit and then you realize, hey, you know what, we can, we can play here. We're, we're fine. Yeah, yeah. These guys told us we could. Now we believe we can. And, you know, we, we looked like we um, – didn't take care of the ball. We didn't. We weren't our aggressive, uh, looking for open threes when they were there, mm -hmm. shooting them rather than looking for them. But we didn't uh, look like we had uh, a sense of urgency early on. And urgency doesn't mean panic, but it's just hey, they give me an open shot, knock it down. Right, we just right. didn't look like we were comfortable in the first few minutes, and then we settled in, and things seemed to go from there. You know, you guys hit a, hit some threes. I know Joe hit a couple threes. Will hits a three, and then Jarris just takes over the game offensively sure. towards the end of the first half. And, and I like I, I keep using this word, spurtability. You guys just you just know it's coming at some point. There's going to be a five-minute stretch of the game where there's, you guys are going to put 20, 25 points on the board. Coach says it all the time, and he talks about it even in pregames a lot. He's like, there's going to be spurts when we score, and there's going to be spurts when they score. You know, you just try to limit those spurts where there's more – positive to your side than negatives. Um, the way we play, you know, there'll be times where we don't score, but we've got to get stops. We can't give up buckets on the other end and not score. Uh, and yeah. those stretches, you know, hopefully are short and not long. And uh, we did do, Jairus did a great job. But our team, you know, part of it is when you make shots, it opens up driving lanes. When you don't make shots and it closes driving lanes, the second half they did a really good job of basically taking – away the driving lanes and we just didn't you know we didn't drive as much as we had been at extra passing but when our offense is going our guys you can tell because the ball moves from one side of court to the other yeah, and yeah. four or five guys touch it right and to be honest with you they don't care who scores they uh -huh. kind of have fun but when you stand around and start watching one guy uh, and it's ten. It was easy to watch Jairus because he he had a nice run. Well, so. <laughs> I tell you what, the, the the end of the half, the crossover and one with the yeah. left-handed finish. That was that was pretty special. Yeah, it's kind of funny, you know. He uh, he has a very uh, good knack for getting in the paint, and he, he's got some weird flick ups and weird finishes around the basket. But I tell you what, he really is a very good finisher. He doesn't uh, shy away from taking the ball hard, and we need him to be like that because it opens lanes for other guys. Other guys on our team, uh, the drivers, it really opens up the court when you've got Will and Joe, and we've got a bunch of other shooters, but I'm just talking to those two guys specifically yeah. when KJ and Jarris and Jordan and Rodney, and those guys can shoot the ball as well, but it's, you know, it's really great when you can drive and kick. Right, and, and that's the thing. Um, you know, we've talked at length about Coach Odom's love of the three, and I, I really love the way guys like Joe and guys like Will are able to get to the three-point line when a guy like Jarris goes to the basket and spot up and find their place and find their shot. Now, a couple of those didn't go down for you in the second half, but at least they've got the concept of what they need to do and, and how they need to do it offensively. They really do. You know, it's, it's, I think we were up 14 and Will missed a layup in transition. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't an easy layup. It was an awkward layup, kind of under the basket, falling a little bit. And then, you know, we had some possessions where – we just didn't finish plays. You know, we, there was a couple fouls here, there. It's not bad calls, but, you know, we also have to guard on the other end and get stops. So yeah. it's about stops and converting, stops and converting. But our guys, coach teaches early on, and, and obviously we've been together now five or six years as, as a staff, him and I. And so I feel like I have an understanding. He's taught me the understanding of what he wants. and But he really wants guys to shoot open shots. You're open. Don't hesitate because we've worked for guys that, 
they cringe when a shot goes up. Even if it's a great <laughs> shooter, if he misses it, they cringe. Coach Odom's not like that. He, yeah. Yeah, I've been, I can tell you many stories over the years of where he's yelling at guys to shoot the ball, and they're like, well, Coach, the, the, the other guys didn't want me to shoot it. Well, we want you to shoot it. So part of it is building confidence. Coach sure, is sure. very good at building guys' confidence, and, and obviously shooters better play with confidence or they're not going to go down. So. No doubt. Um, it's tied at 60, uh, about 340 left in the game, or 314 left in the game, and, and they made an amazing run. They, they, made, yeah, they made every shot after the 314 mark. They made two threes, two big threes. They didn't shoot the ball well for most of the game, but they made two big threes, a couple baskets, and then 10 straight free throws when you guys are trying to get back into the game. That's tough to come back from when, uh, when you're on the road against a quality opponent. You know, we tried that going into it. We said if, if the game gets tight, number three, we can't let him get to the line. Mm -hmm. I think he's, he's averaging just under 19 at, at mid-18s. He shot eight straight free throws. He had 11, I believe, and finished with 19. He had 11 going into the last minute. And our, we wanted to deny him out and make other guys catch the ball and foul those guys. We didn't do a good job of it. Um, it's something new that we haven't had to face, so we, you know, we taught it going in. But now we've seen it. Now we know what to do. So hopefully we'll, you know, we'll have better outcome next time. But obviously, you'd like to think that, you know, they don't make free throws, but they are a good free throw shooting team. So yeah. you know, they did their job. We've seen how good and how deep you guys are at the guard position. Rodney Elliott comes off the bench again, scores twelve for you guys. How great has it been to get him back healthy? Not even I don't even know if he's healthy or not, but he's able to play and able to contribute for you guys over the last couple weeks. You know, it's interesting. You look you look when coach took the job, they had different guys that started, they played different minutes, a new style, a new coaching staff. Uh, these guys have been very, very receptive. And um, I think winning, when you're sure. winning, you sure. can be receptive to it. Uh, you know, and everybody has a role. But I think that even when he hasn't been in the game, he's been cheering, he's been really good in practice. His injury, you know, obviously he's been out for a while. He missed some games early. Yeah. So getting the chemistry back has been a big part. You know, just understanding now there's a lot of times there's four guards on the floor versus three and, and two big type guys. But it's been good because it creates versatility. We can play big, we can play small. And for us, that's an advantage because, yes, we do have to guard other people, but they have to guard us as well. So, yeah. you know, there's a, there's a chess master with that. Rodney really plays – with his emotions on his sleeve. How big of a challenge is that to help him understand, to kind of be able to control those emotions? You know, and, and look, there's, there's times when you see things that happen on the court. He's justified in some of the things that are going on, but you know as well as I do, you have to figure out a way to get through that and still keep your emotions in check. Late in the game, I don't even know if it was late in the game, but you know, Rodney got called twice for push fouls on box outs. On a, a, a plays yeah. away from the even play that yeah, was even not even a, a factor in the play. And we had went over, they'll crash on the weak side, and basically our plan you know, w was going to allow those guys to be in a position that they were going to have to go back and box out. They, mm -hmm. They're going to be standing on the rim because these guys are coming in from the weak side, the way we loaded the ball in that particular game. And, and you know, it was unique because Rodney threw his hands up, and he didn't mean it bad. You know, we kids – you want kids to play with emotion, right, so you right. can't say he was at fault. But when his first one, he was like, I didn't do it. And, you know, you're like, okay. And then you watch the film, and it's like a two-hand push. And he didn't intentionally <laughs> do it. But, right. you know, you get caught up in it, but, but you want emotion. You just – the only downfall is you don't want it to show a referee up because right. a referee, they don't forget, may not, right? he may not know your they heart and your intent. Yeah. They don't, and maybe they don't give you a call later. And those are the things that you have to channel. Young kids don't understand that. They'll understand it later on in life. But a lot of times you can't let your emotions get the best of you. you just got to move on. And we say it a lot, next play, next play. Um, but Rodney's certainly his love of the game, his love for UMBC, um, and his love for winning. I mean, he really wants to win. So his – his desire to do that. We just, you know, got to got to teach him keep moving. So nine games in now, um, and I, I get the feeling you guys are really getting into a nice rhythm rotation wise. You're going about eight or nine deep a game, maybe ten. And you I, you got a good feel of how things are going to play out as you guys move into conference play. It's been good. You know, it's it's our guys are very, uh, like I said, the roster with with what coaches decided, big small. We've got some flexibilities. Um, we can, when guys zone us, we can put in shooters. When guys don't, you know, we can, we've got some flexibility to that. But I'll tell you what, even our bench, the guys that aren't playing on a daily basis, some of them started games last year. And mm -hmm. they're not, you know, and they've, they've been a very, um, at least from what we understand and what we see, they've been a very positive impact on it. They're cheering, they're up. 
you know, they'll get their chance. You never know. I mean, and, and it's next man down. I mean, guys can go down with injuries, and you've got to be ready to step up. And when it's your opportunity, I mean, opportunity knocks, you got to be able to do it. So it's been nice to have depth, but we've also got guys that, you know, can step in, and we expect if something happens for them to step in injury-wise. So. And, Coach, you know, people, fans don't realize this, but those guys are crucial as far as well as getting re- guys ready to play and being those guys in practice that are huge in pushing other guys. It really, it really is a, a major role. Guys have got to understand, and our guys do, that we're trying to get these guys better. Well, it, to get playing time and help us get better, you need to get better in practice. Well, right now we need you to run the scout team. And some of our guys, and, and I say some not meaning any of have not, but they've all really um, embraced that role. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, it's like, hey, you know what? Do this. It's, it's, it's helping us. We get a W and we're all, you know, we all come out happy. So they've been very good about embracing it, and we're really happy. I mean, coaching the staff's very ecstatic about what we've seen from take, that group. Take me back to when you guys first sat down as a staff and kind of realized that you were here and you're at UMBC now and what those expectations were, knowing that this is a team that had won five, had won four, had won seven. I mean, and, and take me to now to where you're seven and two. I mean, how much has everything you thought about when you started changed now that you've had some success through the first nine games? We as a staff, I know Coach and I specifically, and, and Bryce had worked with us last year too as well, and um, we, we decided not to watch film. We didn't watch film on these guys to have any preconceived notions mm-hmm. on because what the old staff did in the old regime is different than what Coach is going to do. And to be fair to them, um, we didn't choose them. They chose UMBC. Coach was fortunate that administration and, and Tim Hall and Dr. Hrabowski chose him. Now we've got to find a way with what we've got. Mm-hmm. Instead of you know releasing those guys and doing that, we felt like they wanted to be here, and there's a reason they recruited them. So let's you know hopefully they can fit into what we're going to do. We may have to make some adjustments along the way, but it's been very good. It's been very receptive. I think. The guys like playing um, for a confident coach, and I don't mean coach is arrogant. I mean coach is confident, no, right, right. There's, perceiving there's confidence line, right? and yeah. handing it to them. So, hey, I believe in you. Now let's just go do it yeah. and have fun doing it. We want them to have fun. But there's going to be some accountability. And I think our style, I think those guys, you know, I, style of play and slowing it down. When you start playing fast, you don't realize you play eight minutes or you play 28 minutes. Right. You really don't. Because you're, you you're going and huffing it for the, every time, every second you're in the game. It's true. And it's been refreshing, I think, for the most part, our guys. I think anytime you have change, you don't know. You know, mm-hmm. there's a little wall or a little bit of resistance because it's a different routine. They did practice different. They did warm-ups different. They did drills different, you right. know. And we've got to teach new things and hold them accountable with what we want. And I think they've been very good at it. So. No doubt, no doubt. Um, Towson on Saturday night. How aware are you guys as a, as a staff of how important this game is here at UMBC? Well, any, any game's important. Um, you, you certainly want to treat them all the same. Um, you have a chance to win or lose the game or, or play well or play not. So we're going to prepare just like it's any any game, um, we understand that it's a rival game, and believe me, we want to win it, mm-hmm. just like we would Loyola or any other game in town. But we also, when we're playing Richmond, we're treating it the same way. If we're playing Messiah, we're treating it the same way. Um, you know, it's if you put added pressure, we don't need the added pressure. We just need to come out, play our game. Um, yes, they do things very well. Yeah. And yes, there'll be an added boost, hopefully with, with fans in the seats. You know, the Beltway rivalry. You know, those things are, do play into effect. But at the same time, it's still a game. It's still tip the ball up. you still got to put it in the basket. you still got to guard and defend right. and rebound. So, right. you know, that's, we're going to treat it like any other game because you don't need the added pressure. It's Last thing for you, I'm looking at Twitter today, and I'm seeing UMBC basketball players handing out Chick-fil-A to students around the UMBC campus. Uh, talk about whose idea was that? That's a great idea to kind of bond the players with some yeah. of the students during finals week, right? You know, a lot of places we've been, uh, all of us and our whole staff, we've done different things, hand out donuts, or at times we've even done coffee places. But um, I know, I don't know if it was marketing, I think Coach Aldridge, who does a lot of that stuff and his role as operations, um, I know Bryce 
plays a role in it at times too and, and, and the rest of us. But I think those guys had the idea, you know, we were talking about passing donuts out or what can we do. And it's great because you can help the student body. At the same time, we've been fortunate to do well early on. Some people still don't know we have a basketball team. I'm sure. Yeah, it right, does it, right, right. No offense. It's just a college campus. But we've got a big game coming Saturday and a chance for them to get, uh, like we said yesterday, it was a study break. You know, hey, we're passing out Chick-fil-A. Good luck with your exams. If you need a break from studying, we play at 7 o'clock Saturday. You and, go. you know, yeah. we have a game Monday. So, you know, I think it was a chance to – it was very good because I think our players – we said it as a staff, coach said it today, our players understand that giving back, it's part of servanthood's part of one of, one of our uh, slogans. So, right. you know, I think those guys understood when they put a smile, coach said it today, put a smile on those guys or ladies' faces, you know, hey, they're sitting there and all of a sudden, you know, they may have not thought about eating over right. two, be three, for, five yeah, hours. Yeah. And all of a sudden you get a free sandwich. It's not about coming to our game it's about that's what life is about you know you're giving to someone and and hopefully you can put a smile on their face and, and help out so. awesome no doubt coach uh, great to catch up with you again uh, s- uh saturday night towson here at the rack arena seven o'clock tip off and it's uh, it's a back-to-back two games in three days as um so citadel comes to umbc on monday night as well seven o'clock tip off there coach dixon thank you so much i appreciate Good luck. it appreciate it thanks for everything coming back after the break we'll talk with umbc forward nolan garrity Welcome back to the show, the Ryan Odom UMBC Basketball Show, the podcast here uh, at the Rack. And I'm joined now by UMBC sophomore forward Nolan Garrity. What's happening, Nolan? Not much. Living the dream. Also, I need to give you the handshake, the yep. handshake, the two-fingered handshake. That's what we do here. That's what you do. Yes, my thing. It's, it's your thing, right? Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, Nolan, talk to me about this year. You guys off to a great start, 7-2. Yeah. and two. And, uh, and you, how good does this team feel about themselves right now? You know, we feel good, but uh, we're not complacent. We want to keep winning. We want to keep doing better. Seven and two is great, but eight and two is even better. Uh, Rodden tells us that every time before we go out. Seven and two sounds a lot better than, you know, the other way around. So it's just each game at a time. We want to win each game as we go in, not looking too far ahead. Talk to me about, um, in your eyes, what's, what's the biggest difference between last year and this year, obviously for you, you dealt with the injury last year. That kind of set you back mm-hmm. all the way towards the middle of the season. And I get, I'm guessing that coming back from an injury is always tough because, first of all, you didn't ne- you get to train to begin with, and then you're coming back from the injury. So being healthy this year, how big is and how huge has that been for you? Uh, it's definitely big mentally. Uh, physically, I definitely felt the difference. When I came back last year, my first game was at Howard. I remember one time up and down the court, I was dead tired. But that's just, you know, being out for so long. So mentally for me, knowing that I'm here for the whole season, knowing that I'm ready, that I put in all those extra, you know, days with all my teammates, it's really helpful to see, like, all the progression, you know. Tell me what it's like to be the big man on a team with about 100 guards that shoot threes, and and you're the man that's your job, obviously, clean up the boards, and, and, and get the putbacks and get the layups, and, and you're shooting, what, 62% from the floor. So you're that inside guy. I mean, it's got to be pretty cool, right? Yeah, it's not always the most glamorous job, but uh, it's definitely an important job, and that's kind of my mindset going into each game. Uh, I don't have to do anything flashy, but know what to do when I get the ball, know the, make the right decision when I get it. What about playing with a guy like KJ, a guy like Jarish? You always, you always have to be aware, right, because you mm-hmm. never know when KJ's going to slip you that pass, yeah. and he's, he's pretty, pretty adept at that. Yeah, uh, they're definitely both very good guards. Uh, they have caught me slipping a couple <laughs> times where I wasn't ready, but uh, they're, just, they're great players, so they've made me a lot better. I've never played with guards as good as they are until I got here. So, you know, each day with them in practice and in games, they make me better, make me better uh, outside of just inside the paint, too, getting people open, uh, getting other people good shots, too. You talked about conditioning. I'd have to think that watching the style of play that Coach Odom has, that had to be the number one, number two, number three, number four thing coming in was you guys have to be ready to play 40 minutes up and down the floor. And to me, that's been a major weapon against other teams is that I never see any of you guys grabbing your shorts or bent over ready for to come out of the game. I mean, guys are in tip-top physical shape. Yeah, but uh, that came at the price of a very tough fall and a very tough summer. <laughs> uh, not to say that it wasn't worth it, it was definitely worth it, but Coach Amenta and Coach Ryan Odom, they got us ready for the season. They definitely did. What, did, what kind of stuff did you guys do? Was, is, it, is it wind sprints? Was it long distance running? What did they do to get you ready to play? 
It was a lot of, it wasn't a ton of sprints, but uh, some sprinting drills, a lot of things working on athleticism like cone work, cone drills, but uh, a lot of it came from just playing with each other because the best way to get better in games is to play basketball games, so playing a lot of pickup is what got us ready okay. to. Okay, all right. Uh, free throw shooting. Last year you struggled a bit, for, I think 42% from the, from the free throw line last year. This year you've been money. Uh, you haven't gotten there a lot, but you've, been, well, you've made your shots when, you, when you've been there. Um, is it just confidence? I mean, wh watching you shoot free throws last year, it didn't seem – you had good form, just wouldn't go down. Is, is it a confidence issue? And, and how much confidence has this coaching staff given you guys coming in here this year? Yeah, I think a lot of it is uh, confidence and putting pressure on myself. Mm -hmm. uh, that's because whenever I shoot, I never feel like it – when it's coming off my hands that it's like a really bad shot or anything. But uh, just this year, I think being a year into it, uh, gives me a lot more confidence, relieves a little bit of the pressure. Not to say that I'm, you know, the best free throw shooter, but I'm making steps in the right uh, direction. Um, we know there's a lot of guys on this team that can shoot the three. Sherburn's shooting about 54% from the three-point line. Um, Darley's crushing it. I know I've seen you in practice step back and, and knock down threes. What's, what's the rules? What are the big man rules for Coach Odom as far as Nolan Garrity shooting the three? Well, the three's coming soon. <laughs> but because uh, you haven't even attempted one yet, right? Yeah, not yet. But it's coming soon. Uh, not really in that position during games to right, just right. step back and take one. But you know, coach has told me uh, to keep practicing for it. He's not against it. Uh, if I can knock it down, I can knock it down. But right now, anything anything inside the three point line is fair game. So I can see the end of next year, uh, senior year, knocking one down. All right. Um, a couple. All kidding aside, uh, Darley and Sherburn. The kind of matchup problems they give other teams, being six 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 eight, and being able to go out behind that line and force other teams to guard them out there. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's big for us because uh, that helps everyone out. Because you know, with someone like Will, he can score inside the post, he can score outside. So really, any matchup he has, he has a mismatch. If they put a big guy on him, he can take them outside, beat him going to the hoop. If they put a little guy on him, he can take them inside the post. So that's really big for us. Tell me about Jarris Lyles. I mean, this he, sometimes you just watch him play, and he's you, it, does it. Is it tough sometimes? Because it it's easy to stand there and watch him because he's. I mean, the crossover move that we yeah. talked about at the end of the first half, the ability to score. Um, it has to be. It has to be like fun to watch him on the court, right? Yeah, it's fun sometimes to just watch him up there and uh, you know work on his craft, go up there, do his own thing. But uh, I catch myself watching him sometimes. And I have to remember, <laughs> all right, get someone else open, go do something. So. That's what he does well. That's what we need him to do. We need him to be that player for us. But, uh, you know, he does a lot of other things that go unnoticed. He's a good defender, a good rebounder, and he's good at getting everyone else the ball. Uh, everyone sees him at the score, but he's a good teammate as well. You're from Cleveland. Um, I think you guys got like 100 feet of snow today, by the way. Yeah, um, it's not pretty. Uh, but talk to, talk to me about the process. I know that the... The, the former coaching staff, went to, when they went to Akron, I think, was when, when they recruited you. You got to spend some time around them. How crazy has it been for you to now have a different coaching staff? And, and was there a point where you were like, well, you know, do I want to stay? Do I not want to stay? And take me through that whole process of change and kind of what you saw in your eyes from one coaching staff to the next. Well, I think it kind of crossed everyone's mind. Do we want to stay and give this coaching staff a chance or do we want to take our business elsewhere? But... I saw coming in that the coaching staff was very committed. Uh, my biggest worry was if they were just going to push the old players to the side and try and bring in a bunch of new people, which, I mean, they brought in their recruits, but they didn't uh, seem to favor them over everyone else. Mm -hmm. And that was big to me. I wanted to know that I was still going to be, like, considered. And uh, Coach definitely proved that he's willing to work with us, and I'm willing to work with him, so I figured I'd give it a shot. There you go. Um, Cleveland Sports, great it's a great time in Cleveland sports. It is. Except for one team, and we'll talk about them, but the Cavaliers championship. Uh, how crazy was it in Cleveland in the summertime with the Indians? Um, and, w and what they were able to do, uh, it's got to be a great time to be a Cleveland sports fan. It is. Uh, one of the rare moments that you can be proud to be a Cleveland sports fan. But uh, I was actually able to go downtown when the Cavs were in the finals. Uh, didn't have tickets, obviously, but... Being able to be around Clevelanders and be in the streets of Cleveland when they won Game 7, it was ridiculous. Yeah. You know, the things I saw that I can't speak about on camera, but <laughs> saw a lot of crazy things. And then the Indians obviously did, had a very good season as well, mm -hmm. and I think they're going to be in the same position again next year too. Yeah, great run, no question. 
Uh, how concerned, though, are you with the Browns? Will they win a game this year, or is it going to be 0-16? I would love to see an 0-16 season, actually. Uh, you know, the ship has sailed with the Browns. There's no, we're not getting anything out of this season, so why not make Number a little Number one history? pick, right? Yeah. Number one pick? Uh-huh. Now, would you participate? There's been talk. I've heard talk in Cleveland about a possible parade if the, if the Browns go 0-16. Would you participate in that? I would definitely be down there. Uh, Clevelanders know how to have a fun time regardless of the occasion, so I would definitely be down there, you know, supporting them. Now, I've been told, too, Nolan, that you are – by far, it's not even close, the biggest prankster on the team. So I need to know the greatest prank that you've ever pulled. Uh, I don't know if it's the greatest, but it's the one I pull the most often. Uh, my roommate is Joe Sherburn, and so very <laughs> frequently I will purposely leave him to go get food and then come back with food and sit there, and he freaks out every <laughs> single time. Every <laughs> single time he yells, he screams, and it's more enjoyable every time. Give, give us some. Um, Joe seems to be, you know, he seems like you to kind of go to the beat of a different drummer. Mm -hmm. So give us a good Joe Sherburn fact. I know he's a huge Packers fan, but what's a good Joe Sherburn fact? He has very strange taste in music. You know, most guys on the team will listen to either like hip hop or rap or uh, maybe like alternative rock or something. He's a huge Michael Bublé fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, is that is that legit, or are you just kidding? No, that's, no you're serious. that's serious. That's serious. Every time I come back to the room, he's listening to Michael Bublé's Christmas album. Crazy, crazy Which stuff. I don't mind, but... Crazy. What do you do? What do you listen to to get yourself fired up? Do you listen to music before games? I do. Um, I am very diverse as far as music. Uh, Hip-hop and rap, rock, and, like, EDM, like, yeah, okay. dance music, sure. too. So, a little bit of everything. Got gotcha. you. Yeah. Um, last thing for you, a controversial topic. I know you're a huge Cavs fan. We mm -hmm. talked about their championship. Um, fans last night drove countless hours, spent $800 to go to a Cavs game. No LeBron. Nobody played. I yeah. mean, that's got to be frustrating. Yeah, but, you know, $800 is a lot of money, but back-to-back -back Cavaliers championships is priceless. So that's what I would tell that fan. And you never know what the LeBron might see that on Twitter and send him a little care package or something. But... I'd rather have another championship than, you know, one extra game played. How cool would it be to have somebody spend $800 to watch you play? I mean, that's, that's pretty cool, right? <laughs> it's not bad. <laughs> that's bad at all. Nolan, appreciate the, oh, wait, appreciate yep. the time. Thank you. Good luck the rest of the season, and we'll be Thank watching you down the court, all right? Sounds good. You got it. Nolan Garrity joining us here on the program. Don't forget, Saturday, Towson, 7 o'clock here at the Rack, and then the Citadel come in as well on Monday night, two games in three days here for UMBC uh, before, uh, or I guess during exam week here on campus. Uh, come on out to the rack, support the team, and, uh, and watch them do battle. That's going to do it here for the Ryan Odom UMBC basketball show. Thanks to Nolan Garrity. Also, thanks to Coach Nate Dixon as well. We'll talk to you next week here on the show.